Let's look at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We'll be looking at the uh, second part of verse 2 a little more closely later on this morning. It, there's a mention in there about something called the will of God. And uh, the will of God comes up every now and then because uh, uh, when you're in a tight fix, you don't know what to do, you have a decision to make, maybe there's a, a situation going on and you don't know how to handle it. One of the things we want to know is, what does God want me to do? What is the will of God? Um, and uh, frankly, the will of God is a good thing to know and a good thing to do. Now, when I was coming up uh, back in the 60s and 70s, 1960s and 1970s, okay. but anyway, uh, when, whenever we talked about the will of God, there was always somebody who was there to, to give us a real good handle, a way to know the will of God. Wouldn't you like to know that? I, I know I did. I, how do I know the will of God? And so they gave us a series of steps, things to do so that you can do, know and do uh, the will of God. And so I, I'd just like to give that to you so uh, you have it um, in your arsenal, in your tool bag of spiritual tricks. So, uh, but if you want to know the will of God, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to know God. You've got to know who God is, and that's possible only through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Only as you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, confess your sins, the blood of Jesus um, cleanses us from our sins, we're made whole again, and so only because of Jesus, only because of his cross can we know God at all. So the first thing to know the will of God is make sure you're a Christian. Yeah. Make sure that you know uh, that you belong to the family of God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So that's the first thing. But then make sure you know God because you're sort of in touch with him on an ongoing basis. And that has to do with being part of a church family, be a part of worship, have a, a, a fellowship of Christians around you. These are the folks who will help you get a grounding. They'll sort of give you perspective. Uh, they'll give you the uh, kind of warning signals and you're wandering off path. So make sure that uh, you're part of the body of Christ that you're inside of the church. And then make sure your relationship with God is up to date. Make sure that it's an ongoing uh, relationship and that you've confessed all the known sin in your life. Now, that sounds pretty easy until you realize that's a very long list for a, long of us, a lot of us. And for most of us, there's a sin or two that we're not quite that upset about yet. Uh, we know it's a sin. We know it's sort of displeasing, but we don't think it's that bad. And so uh, we're sort of comfortable with that sin, and we, we hang on to it. But if you want to know the will of God, confess the unknown sin, clear the decks, get the rebellion in your life, get that out of the way so that uh, you're able to relate to God in a more clear and more direct way. So confess the, um, the known sin in your life. Um, then also make sure that you're in the Word that uh, the Word of God is being uh, just sort of saturating your mind so that you start to think in biblical categories, you start to evaluate things on, the, on a uh, biblical system of priorities, that uh, the way you look at the world is the way the Bible looks at the world, the way that God would have us to look through the lens of Scripture so we see what the world looks like. So uh, make sure that you're spending time in the Word. And then also, if you're going to know the will of God, then pray. Now, pray in general, that is, have that ongoing conversation with God where you're speaking with him, he's speaking with you, guiding your life in all things, but also pray about the specific situation. Pray about the, uh, uh, the thing that's bothering you. Pray about that, that big question that you have that you're bringing before the Father. Now, most of us have this problem that we think prayer is all about us telling God what's, what is going on. So, like, he doesn't know what's happening. We, we pray like Elijah, oh Lord, I'm here all by myself. Prophets of Baal, yeah, you, you wipe them out, but, but that queen, she's after me and I'm all alone here, Lord. You didn't know that, but I thought I'd tell you. <laughs> you, know? and you, you remember and God said, well, actually, Elijah, I got about 7,000 more just like you, so uh, uh, you, you sort of missed the boat. But we think that prayer is telling God something he doesn't know. God, you didn't know about this problem. So I need to tell you about the problem. Now, the reason we tell God about the problem is so that we are in conversation and surrendering and yielding the problem to him. And that is the way that we surrender the, the problem uh, to him. Uh, sometimes we think that prayer is all about us telling God what he needs to do to answer the, the situation. Lord, you need to do this, 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 and this in order to um, uh, extricate me from this hole I've dug for myself. And uh, Lord, I'm, I'm telling you, here's what you need to do. Uh, get back to me if it's a problem. No, but uh, in prayer is actually saying, Lord, what is it you want to do? 
You know, what, what is your will for this? And so in prayer, surrender the need. Surrender the problem, the concern, the question. Uh, in prayer, surrender it to God. Then listen for an answer. You know, sometimes God speaks directly to us, that, that moving of the heart, that leadership of the spirit within that uh, just sort of gives us a drawing, an understanding of what we need to do. So sometimes God gives us a direct kind of leading. Uh, many times God speaks through the word. Uh, oftentimes there's a commandment, there's a, an example, there's an encouragement, there's something in the word that will speak to our situation. And having prayed that God would show us the way, then he gives us a scripture. Uh, sometimes he speaks through a brother or a sister in Christ, somebody in the church who uh, uh, gives us some wise counsel or who uh, uh, sort of gives us a different perspective. Perhaps they've been through the same problem, the territory, and they give us some help on that. And so we, uh, we can take uh, that kind of advice. Uh, many times uh, God will answer the prayer through the counsel of people who love us and know us best. Uh, the people who love us enough to tell us that uh, we're off track and maybe we've missed the, the angle that we're supposed to be on. And so, um, you know, we need to listen to, the, to those kinds of people in our lives. Sometimes God will even speak through a sermon. I know it's, it, it's hard to believe that. But, but occasionally, it, you know, usually what happens is the Holy Spirit just sort of gets hold of our thinking. And while, while I'm up here and I'm, I'm pontificating and telling you all about the intricacies of the Jebusites remaining in Jerusalem until the time of David, and I'm telling you what happened to the Jebusites, you're sitting there and the Holy Spirit is saying, well, you know, you need to think about this and this, that, and the other. And your whole mind is just going where the Holy Spirit's leading. And then after the sermon, you come up and tell me how great I was. <laughs> But it's, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. But, but sometimes something is said, uh, it might be a book you're reading, a magazine article, it might be something on the radio, something of that nature. But listen for an answer to the prayer, and then as God gives you that answer, do it. You know, a lot of times when we say, I don't know what the will of God is, what we really mean to say is, I don't have the courage to do what I know the will of God is. Uh, but once he's shown us uh, what he wants us to do, then do it. Uh, just step out. And a lot of times it takes faith, um, uh, but we just step out so that um, we might be found in obedience. Then, once you've done that, you've prayed about it, you've connected up with God, prayed about it, updated the relationship, you're spending time in the Word, you've prayed, you've listened for an answer, you've gotten a leading, you're stepping out in faith, and you're doing what, what God's asked you to do, then be open to reproof and correction. You know, believe it or not, sometimes we make mistakes. You know, every now and then uh, we, we might uh, just sort of miss what God was actually trying to say. I, th I think sometimes God takes us down a road to a dead end just to say, look, don't ever think about this road again. Don't ever, don't ever, you know, just, just put that one to bed. You don't need to think about that anymore. Now, let's go over here. I have something better for you. you your, your mind was over here, and I just had to show you that was wrong. So be open to correction. To God redirecting you in your life. And then, at the end of all that, just claim the promise of, of the Bible that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That God can fix our mistakes, he can fix our missteps, that he can still bring himself glory, he, and he can still work things out. So, I hope that's just sort of a, a real brief, quick run-through on some of the things, you know, when you're trying to know the will of God. Um, that's, that's kind of a good list. Um, I learned it in, in college. Um, it's, it's really served me well on many occasions. Um, it's been several sermon series, so, you know, I just thought I'd give that to you in a, in a quick 10 minutes. Now, this passage of Scripture that we have now in Romans 2, when we get to uh, the tailor when he's mentioning the will of God, I wanted you to have that sort of uh, handle on knowing the will of God so that when we start talking about the will of God, it's not just some sort of abstract idea to you, but it's something concrete. It's something very, very real that Paul is talking about. Because as we're going through Romans chapter 12, you need to have Romans chapters 1 through 11. Shall we go over those again? <laughs> chapters 1 through, they'd be worth going over again, but, but uh, chapters 1 through 11, that's what he means when he says, by the mercies of God, based on what God has done in the gospel, get, based upon what he has done by his grace, then Paul says, I'm begging you, make your body a sacrifice, a living life of worship to God. And then here he's going to say, 
and renew your mind so that you can do the will of God. The body and the mind together brought in by the mercies of God, by the power of the gospel, so that we would live out what it means to belong to the Father through the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then the rest of chapter 12 is, is, is just sort of fleshing out what does that mean? What does that look like? And uh, we'll be getting to that sometime, I think, the end of this month uh, or so. But uh, so that, that's where we are. We are in verses 1 and 2. We are walking between 1 through 11, the mercies of God in Christ Jesus, into Romans 12, which is what, what happens, what, what does it mean in your life as a result of that. And we're doing that so we can catch up with our kids who are already Romans 12 kinds of believers. We want to be Romans 12 kinds of Christians, Amen. right? So that's why we're here. With all of that, now let's look at verse 1. <coughs> Romans 12, verse 1. Paul writes, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let's bow together in prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we woke up this morning and we heard the rain. Just a moment ago, we could have looked out the window and seen the rain <coughs> blowing sideways past the, the building. And we are reminded that you caused the rain to fall upon the just and the unjust. Father, there are times when we receive the blessings of your watch, care, and providence for us. And it just makes sense to us because we feel as though we're in the midst of, of living for you and our lives reflect something of your justice and mercy. But, Father, how thankful we are that the rain also falls upon the unjust, that in our sin and in our times of rebellion, in those moments when we've left you entirely out of our thinking and, and, and consideration, that yet you care for us and still you provide for us. And still you send the refreshing of the rain, even upon the unjust. Father, that kind of mercy is beyond us. That kind of love is just way more than we can fathom. But what a delight it is when you open our eyes to see how you sent Christ to die for us, the just for the unjust, the one who knew no sin, to die for us, the sinner. And so, Father, we pause to thank and praise you for grace and mercy, but also ask that uh, that blessing and that mercy, those showers of blessings that you poured into our lives would transform us, would motivate us, that we would have the keener desire to live for you, to manifest your glory, to be found as obedient children for you. Father, I thank you for being kind, for being gracious, for loving us. I thank you for the way in which you work in our lives. Thanking you in Jesus' name. Amen. Life really is better when you do what God wants you to do. But what I've discovered over the years since I discovered that little list of to-dos, things to do to know the will of God, is I've discovered the will of God is so much deeper than that. It's so much more than just what do I do to get a better job? What do I do to make the right decisions? What do I do so that my family runs right? What I've discovered is that knowing and doing the will of God has to do with the inner transformation of who you are, and that the will of God is not so much about what you do, although that's included, but what it's really about is who you are that results in what you do. I want for us to get that uh, clear in our minds before we move on in to Romans 12, because Romans 12 has a lot of things to do, a lot of things that, that are part of God's will, His design for our lives. And each one of the things we'll be reading about in, in the weeks ahead and months ahead um, actually has some, uh, just, just good, solid advice. And you can even share it with your pagan friends. You can share it with folks who know nothing about Jesus and care nothing about Jesus. And a lot of it is just good advice advice for life. I mean, things like, you know, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. I mean, that's good advice to be sympathetic. 
to have empathy for others, to be able to share in their joy and to support them in in their sorrow. That's just good advice. But there's more to it than that. Because when we weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice, we do so as children of God, bought by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, through whom the grace of God has brought out a a change in our lives and can claim that, that situation of grief or joy for the glory of God. It's so much more. You know, a little bit later on, he'll he'll, uh, say something like, Bless those who curse you, and thereby you will heap coals upon their head, fiery coals upon their head. I love that verse. I I, I don't know what we'll do when we get there, but I sort of love that verse because it's a twofer. (laughs) You know, you bless somebody, they curse you, you bless them, you confuse the stew out of them. That's great. And then God pours coals of fire on their head and they get it anyway. (laughs) But we'll have to understand what that means. But it's more than just how to cope with criticism. Brother, how do you glorify the Father in the name of the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit when people are opposed to you and would actually curse you? See, not, not to read the whole chapter 12, but when we get to talking about a Romans 12 Christian, it's not just to have neat advice about how to make life better. It is rather what is the expression of the internal change, the radical transformation that has taken place within the inner person, how does that work out in day-to-day life? And that's what we'll be looking at. Because Christ came not to make life better. As John prayed a moment ago, Christ came to make that which was dead alive. He didn't come to just continue on what was happening, but just make it a little better. He came so that there might be a newness of life. That's why when Nicodemus came to Jesus at night and he said, what do I have to do to get into heaven? And Jesus said, well, Nick, I think what you need to do is be born again. Now, that's a category that did not fit anything in the mind of Nicodemus. It didn't fit the category of anybody in the world at that time. Frankly, other than believers in Christ, it doesn't fit our categories of thinking. Nicodemus thought Jesus would say, well, just keep up what you're doing And just do it a little better and a little harder. Jesus said, you've got to let go of everything you've ever had. And you need to be born again. You go to Revelation chapter 21, and there John says at the closing, the next to last chapter in the Bible, he says, I saw a new heaven, and I saw a new earth. And a little bit later down in the same chapter, he says, and I saw a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. In verse 5, Revelation chapter 21, it says, the one seated upon the throne. That's how the book of Revelation refers to God in his sovereignty and his majesty. It says, the one seated upon the throne says, behold, I make all things new. He doesn't just come to renovate. He comes to make things new again. So it doesn't surprise us that Paul, when he was writing to the Corinthians for the second time, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he says, look, if anybody's in Christ, he is what? A new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new has come. And so when we talk about doing the will of God and knowing the will of God, it's not a matter of just finding helpful hints to make life better. It is rather finding out how we can manifest the inner transformation that God has wrought in our hearts through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's a deeper and, frankly, more profound way to think about the will of God. If you look at what I said about 10 minutes ago, you remember that? You know? Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't that long, folks. <laughs> if I could remember it, you've got to remember it. Okay. But if you look at that, the advice I was given, almost all of it is, here's what you do, here's what you do, here's what you do, here's what you do, here's what you do. And it'll pretty much work as long as you get it straight in your, in your head that it's really about what God does, what God does, what God does, what God does. And anything we talk about that we might be doing is really in response to what God has done first for us. And that's a radically different way to think about life. We're not here to make life better. We're here to live life anew. Remember back when we were in Romans chapter 6 and the whole question there was, well, can you sin that grace might abound? Can you you just do whatever you want because after all, God forgives us by grace and it's works and not grace. can Can you do what you want? And that was the point where Paul says, don't you know that when you were baptized, you were baptized into the death of Jesus? 
You are baptized into the death of sin. Sin has no more life for the believer. We were baptized into his death so that as Jesus was raised from the dead, so too we might walk in a newness of life, that we might have a life in the resurrection power of Christ. Not the same old thing just made better, but something brand new brought about by the grace and the power of God. So as we're thinking about the will of God, how does that work out in Romans chapter 12? What does it mean to be a Romans 12 believer, a Romans 12 Christian? We need to keep that in mind. It all focuses on what God is doing to bring about a radical transformation. Let's look at verse 2. I know time escapes us, but we'll, we'll get this in. If we look at Romans 12, and we start at verse 2, last week we talked about do not be conformed to this world. Don't think that it's just a matter of taking the old world and just cleaning up around the edges. That isn't going to accomplish anything. You do remember Jesus told the story about the man who had the unclean spirit, and the unclean spirit was cast out of the man. And Jesus says the unclean spirit went off into the wilderness because that's what unclean spirits do for vacation. You know, they just like to go into the desert, play the slots. What stays in, happens in the desert stays in the desert. <laughs> So you've got to stay away for these. But the unclean spirit goes out into the desert. And then after a while, he says to himself, you know, I think I'll go check on the old neighborhood. I think I'll go see what's happening to that guy. And he goes back and he finds that what the guy has done, what the man has done, is he's gotten rid of the unclean spirit. Hooray! And he has swept out his, his house and he has cleaned his house and everything is nice, nice and in order but he has put nothing there in the place of the unclean spirit. All he has done is renovated the old man. The old man used to have a Holy Spirit, uh, uh, an unclean spirit, got rid of that, and so now he's just better. That's all. And the unclean spirit comes in and says, that's really nice. Goes out, gets seven of his friends, they come in, they party all night, and the estate of that man is worse than it was at the first. Why? Because he was not changed, he was just renovated and improved a little bit. When we are called to Christ, we are called to be born again, to be made new, to become a new creation, to have a transformation take place in our lives. And so do not be conformed to the world. That is, don't, don't just think it's a matter of just improving what was there. It's a matter of recreation. So here's how Paul talks about it in the last part of verse 2. He talks about a transformation, he talks about a renewal, and he talks about a demonstration. He says there is a transformation. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Be transformed. If you want a picture image of what that word for transform means, it's the same word used when it talks about Jesus going up onto the mountain where he was transfigured. That's why we call it the Mount of Transfiguration, right? So he went up into the mountain, and while he was there, he began to shine with the glory of God. And dressed in white and a dazzling appearance, and Peter looking at that, he was just blown away by it. He was seeing the glory of Christ. Now, what was happening? The inner glory of Christ that was always there was simply coming out so that Peter could see it. What was true of the inner Jesus was now being made manifest to the uh, eyes of Peter. Peter. So transfiguration in that passage has to do with taking what's on the inside and letting it come out so it can be seen on the outside. And so Paul says, be transformed. There has to be something on the inside that is now working its way to the outside. And that something on the inside is Jesus. That something on the inside is the presence of the Holy Spirit. That something on the inside is the radical new creation that God has wrought when we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So Paul says, be transformed. Let that inner glory of God that he placed there by the power of the Spirit, let that come out in your life. And then he says this, but be renewed. And do that by the renewal of your mind. You've got to start thinking differently than you did before. Now this is more than just... You know, Tony Robbins seminar where you uh, reprogram the mind so you think happy thoughts and do happy things. And 
No, it's a new creation of the mind. In fact, Paul talks about it. Let me, let me read this for you. This is in um, Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, in verse 20, Ephesians 4, 20, he says, This is not the way you learn Christ, assuming you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. But verse 22, put off your old self. This isn't about the old self, just better. Put off the old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And be renewed. This is Ephesians 4, 23. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds. What does that mean? And to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So in Ephesians, Paul says this newness of the mind, the renewal of the mind, the spirit of the mind is a matter of being made to look like the image of God. We know where that's found. It's found in the image of his dear son, Jesus Christ. Because you remember that's God's destiny for your life. Those whom God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his dear son. That's the renewal we're talking about. It's a renewal so that we look like, act like, talk like, make everybody think about Jesus when they see us. You know, we're, we're about eight years behind our kids. Our kids have been going through the Romans 12 uh, program in our, in our church where we've been trying to teach them what it means to let uh, their Christian faith work out in their lives and various things on that. And that's why we're looking at this. We're just trying to catch up to them. But I'm telling you, one of the, one of the joys of watching our kids over the past seven or eight years that we've done Romans 12 kids is that sometimes we are just blown away when we see Jesus in them. And we'll see one of our, our children and they'll see another child who's being left out, who's, you know, off to one side and nobody's talked to. And we, it, I don't see this because they don't allow me close to children. But, <laughs> but that's not true. But Debbie sees this all the time. And you'll see the, uh, somebody go over and they'll take that child by the hand and say, here, you come play with us. Or you see a little child come in and they're scared because it's their first time and they don't know what's going on. And you'll see some other children go over and say, hey, you come sit with me. Or you see other children having a problem and they're, and they're, they're, they're not working it out and, and, and another child will just say, hey, wait a minute, let me stand up for you. We've seen this over and over again in our children and it's because of Romans 12. And what Debbie will do is she'll go up to that child and she'll give that child, I think, the greatest compliment you can ever give a person. She says, I see Jesus in you. I see Jesus in you. What an encouragement. You know, what a joy. I mean, that, that, that you know, you, you sort of hit the heights. And so now at nine years old, it's downhill. But, you know, to, to have Jesus seen in us, that's what Paul is talking about. We need a renewal of the mind so that we are conformed to the image of Jesus Christ so that we start to act and to think like him. Do you real, re, realize how many things Jesus said that challenged our thinking and caused us and causes us to think in a different way that we would never have thought otherwise. You know, things like money. Sorry, money. You thought money was a good thing to have and to, and to build up in your bank account and your retirement account because money would make you secure. It was good to have money. And Jesus said, you know, in point of fact, money can't buy you what really matters. Because at any moment you might hear the voice of God saying, this night your soul is required of you, and now who will get all this money that you thought could save you? And it can't. We thought it was a good thing to build up treasures on earth. And Jesus said, no, don't build up treasures on earth, but build up treasures in heaven. We thought it was a good thing to earn money because after all that was power and security. Jesus said, look, you can't serve God and money, God and mammon. You cannot serve two masters. You can serve God, you can serve money, but you can't serve both. This blew his audience away. They thought, if I'm rich, that must mean God is blessing me. Jesus said, no, in point of fact, if you're rich, you're in deep trouble because it's really, really hard to get you into heaven. In fact, it's easier to take a camel and cram it through the eye of a needle. By the way, you can do it. It makes the camel cranky, but you can do it. But it's easier to get that camel through the eye of a needle than it is to get a rich man into heaven. Jesus said, you've got to change your mind about what money's all about. You thought forgiveness was just a matter of, well, I'll forgive you this time, but Next time around, there's going to be trouble. 
You thought you would come to Jesus and say, Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times. And you thought Jesus would say, wow, Peter, that's really great. Seven times. <laughs> oh, wow. And Jesus said, Peter, when it comes to forgiveness, you keep forgiving and keep forgiving and you keep forgiving. Not seven times, but 70 times seven. And Peter, I don't think you can count that high. And he can't. Because you keep forgiving and keep forgiving. Somebody slaps you on the cheek, you turn the other cheek. Oh, we're so smart. We're such great theologians. I've run out of cheeks. <laughs> Jesus said, no, you don't. You forgive and you forgive and you forgive. And that grudge that you're harboring because it makes you feel so good and so superior, that's, that's a weight that's going to drag you down into the lake. Jesus taught a different way of thinking about forgiveness. He said, think a different way about your language. You thought it was okay to just be cute with your language. You know, we don't actually swear. Well, not with the bad words, but we use words that sound like swearing and sound like bad words. I, I guess grammarians would call them sentence intensifiers. <laughs> They're just expletives and swear words and vulgarities. You know. But Jesus said, no, don't play games with your language. Don't swear by heaven or earth or the altar or the gold on the altar. He said, look, let your yes be yes, your no, no, that's it. Jesus said, you've got to think a different way about your language. All kinds of things. Every time he taught, he was telling people, stop the way you're thinking. Think the way God's, God, God would have us think in his kingdom. Here, here's one of them that I like, like a lot. This, this is something I, I need to say my place. Jesus said this. It's in Luke 14. It starts at verse 12. And Jesus said, he, he, Jesus, said also to the man who had invited him. And Jesus had been invited to a banquet. He had been invited to a party. And now he's talking to the host who has invited Jesus to the party. And he says to him, when you give a dinner or a banquet or a prom, do not invite your friends or your brothers, or your relatives, or rich neighbors, lest they invite you in return and you be repaid. Verse 13, but when you give a prom, invite the poor, and the crippled, the lame, the blind, the special needs, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Jesus taught us to think in a whole different way. Why do you think he told Pilate? He said, look, the king, my kingdom, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. You'll never understand it. My kingdom is not of this world. That's why the Pharisees missed him. They thought the kingdom of God was about the world. And all the kingdom of God would mean is that Messiah would come, pat them on the back, show everybody how righteous they were, and they would get to shine out in front of everybody else. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world because my kingdom is all about the glory of God and it's all about grace. It's about judgment upon sin. It's about resurrection of, uh, from the dead. My kingdom is not of this world. And if we ever get that straight, then we'll start to live as Romans 12 Christians. So Jesus said there's got to be a transformation from within. There's got to be a renewal of the mind and the thinking. And then when, when that happens, you'll start to have the demonstration of the will of God. It, it, it goes like this in, in the, the, the latter part of, um, okay, verse 2. It says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. Uh, those words, by testing you may discern, that's actually one word in the Greek. Uh, the Greek word, dokimatzo, uh, is a word that means um, to test a metal to see if it's pure or to test something to see if it works. That's why I, th I think the King James has prove. Uh, you're going to prove the validity of this thing. It, 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 it's a word that, that was used to test coins, for example. Um, back when uh, gold coins were actually made out of gold, uh, if you got a gold coin, you did not want it to be uh, just a, a lead slug that had been plated with gold. You wanted it to be solid gold. So what you'd do is you would take the, the, the coin and you would bite on it, and real gold would leave teeth marks. Of course, why you didn't just look at it to see if the previous guy had put in teeth marks on it, I don't know. But you did that. And that's the way you, you found out that it, that it was pure gold. That was dokimatsu. That was, that was testing to discern if it was real. And when you're transformed from within, 
so that your mind is renewed and your thinking is renewed. And by the way, and your body is being lived out as a living sacrifice of worship and praise. Then you begin to prove and demonstrate the validity and the reality of the will of God in your life. And that will is good, and it is acceptable, and it is perfect. So Paul says that that's what we're after now in the rest of Romans chapter 12. We're after proving, demonstrating the will of God, demonstrating how this from the inside out aspect of the will of God works out in the life of a believer. And so this morning, I want to give you a challenge. We like to, like to do that. But here's my challenge is to think about the will of God in your life this week. But think of it this way. You can, you can go through the, the steps that I gave you earlier, and they are actually really good steps for a, a system for, for trying to live out and live in the will of God. So hang on to that. But think of it this way. In a given situation, with a given need, with a decision to make, ask yourself, how do I glorify the Father? How do I glorify the Father? Because that's why you were created in the first place. That's why you're here. Whatever else you accomplish in life, only what you do to glorify the Father will last. Mm -hmm. What will glorify the Father? And then ask yourself, what will make me look more like Jesus? What can I do that will make Jesus seen in me, that will put Jesus on display in my life? How will my decisions, how will my demeanor look like Jesus? And then ask, and how can I rely on the Holy Spirit? How can I trust in the power of God? See, Jesus said, you know, with God, everything's possible, but it's only possible not because somehow we're, we're, we're pumped up and motivated. All things are possible because God gives us his Holy Spirit. And when we're living out and striving to live out the will of God so that God the Father would be glorified, so that Jesus the Son would be made manifest, we are relying upon God the Holy Spirit to give us the strength and the power and the motivation and the guidance and the wisdom. Trust the Holy Spirit. How can I rely upon the Holy Spirit? I want you sometime this week, just at some point this week, just once, just sit down and say, in this area of my life, how can I glorify the Father? How can I look like the Son? How can I rely on the Holy Spirit? Because when you do that, you will make manifest a transformation of the mind leading to the demonstration of the will of God. All right. Let's bow in prayer together. And Father, how thankful we are that it is grace and not works, that it is your will and not ours, that it is your design and not our befuddled thinking. Father, that it is your kindness and grace and not our shallowness. Father, how thankful we are for who you are, thankful for the gift of your Son, Jesus, to our lives, and thankful for the gift of the Holy Spirit that we might live in obedience. Father, you deserve all the praise, all the glory. We give it to you now that you would be exalted among the nations, and we thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen.